Welcome back, everyone. It's me, Matt. I hope you're having a wonderful day. We're talking about the A7D Corsair II. Military aviation is something I don't specialize in. I like talking about aircraft and military aircraft in general, but it's definitely not something that I am a subject matter expert in in any way, shape, or form. But when I looked at this aircraft, it's one of those aircraft, once again, that I have kind of neglected to talk about, and it's put to the sidelines because it's not as prominent as some of the more cooler aircraft out there, like the F-4 Phantom or, you know, the F-16 or the F-22. It's kind of a weird looking aircraft a chubby little chunky monster i would say but it's safe to say that this aircraft has served the united states and other countries extremely well during its service and to be honest with you it's a very underrated jet let's talk a little bit about it today and give you an overview of exactly what it's all about so to start where did it come from in the early 1960s, the US Navy was casting about for a new strike aircraft to replace the Douglas A-4 or A-4D Skyhawk, otherwise known as the Scooter. The replacement to offer more payload and more range was priority. Initial studies focused on a supersonic aircraft, but it was gradually realized that supersonic performance was problematic for a low altitude attack aircraft burdened down with external stores. A requirement for the subsonic VAL light aircraft was issued in the spring of 1963, specifying a single-seat aircraft powered by the Pratt & Whitney TF-30 bypass turbojet, the aircraft being armed with twin 20mm cannons and carrying a maximum war load of 5,535kg or 12,200 pounds over a combat radius of 1,110 kilometers or 690 miles or 690 nautical miles. It would also have to have a radar and limited all weather capability. Now the Navy was very prejudiced towards the TF-30 powered Skyhawk or the A4D-6, essentially a scooter on steroids, but other aviation firms lobbied for a competition and it was duly set up very quickly. Along with Douglas, three other firms came up with proposals, including Grumman, North American, and Vought. And more precisely, Ling Temco Vought, or LTV, as the company had become known after mergers in 1961. The Grumman concept, the G12812, was a single-seat version of the company's A6 Intruder, retaining the twin Pratt & Whitney J52 turbojets of the A6 instead of using the TF-30. The North American concept was the NA-295, was based on the company's FJ4 Fury, itself a beefed up derivative of the company's classic F86 Sabre, with the NA-295 featuring a TF-30 engine. Surprise, surprise. It also had a radome in the lower lip of the intake and a bristling with underwing stores. The LTV submission, the V463, had started life as an attack derivative of the firm's F8 Crusader fighter. But, though the LTV pushed the V463's commonality with the F8, as the development proceeded, the commonality completely decayed. That tends to be what happens when an aircraft design is extensively modified for a role it is not originally supposed to perform. But the Navy was still very impressed, awarding the company a contract on the 19th of March 1964 for three prototypes of the A7 Strike Fighter. In 1965, the aircraft received the popular name as the Corsair II. It was the first US aircraft to have the modern heads-up display, which displayed information such as dive angle, airspeed, altitude, drift, and the aiming reticle. The A7 was also the first combat aircraft to feature the Doppler-bounded inertial navigation system, or INS, and a full integrated turbofan engine. In 1967, it was announced from Dallas in Texas, USA, that the Elliott Flight Automation had been awarded a four-year contract to supply LTV with the heads-up displays for the A7. The initial contract was worth $14 million at the time, for 1,200 displays, and was the largest ever awarded to the British firm. By 1970, the A-7D and A-7E began to move to squadron service initially with the United States Navy during the Vietnam conflict and was then adopted by the United States Air Force to replace their A-1 Sky Raiders. They were borrowed from the Navy as well as with the National Guard. It was also exported to Greece in the 1970s and Portugal and Thailand in the late 1980s. The A-7 is fairly straightforward. It's a shoulder wing aircraft with swept wing surfaces provision for in-flight refueling, and a narrow track tricycle landing gear. ANG aircraft retain the folding wings and a rest hook employed on Navy versions, 
but have self-study units and improved aviation systems with continuous solution navigation and weapon delivery systems, which is still considered very accurate for more than two decades after it was designed. The A7 had substantial range, endurance and load carrying capability to close air support missions and battlefield area interdiction missions. In 1971, Vought Aeronautics Corporation donated a silver cup known as the Corsair Trophy in recognition of the division's achievements in designing, developing and manufacturing the A7 heads-up display. Much later in 1978, Corsair building was opened at Rochester again to note this very important program. The A7 HUD was pretty breakthrough for its time in the US markets and was the start of a golden era of heads-up displays. 2,534 of these designs were to be made, and build rates exceeded 30 a month at one time. Unfortunately though, some HUDs were coming in at some quite poor quality in some aircraft. This was noted especially on initial batches, which through quality control was amended in time. During the middle of the Vietnam War, the United States Air Force faced a number of procurement problems. Losses to the F-105 Thunder Chief community were mounting to the point that it was thought the aircraft might become extinct. While the F-111 Aardvark, which was to replace the F-105, was also having numerous teething problems. Another problem was that the Sandy escort units for rescue helicopters were forced to use Korean War era ex-Navy A-1 Sky Raiders, which, while good aircraft overall, were not getting any younger. The United States Air Force needed an aircraft that could replace the A-1 and supplement the F-105 until the F-111 finally reached maturity, and it needed the aircraft immediately and an extremely low cost. After reviewing a number of options, the United States Air Force settled on the US Navy's A-7 Alpha Corsair II. The Navy's F-4B had been adapted to United States Air Force standards and it felt that the A-7 could be as well. An A-7 Alpha was bailed back to LTV for conversion to the United States Air Force specific A-7D variant. Though externally a little different to the Navy A-7 Alpha, the A-7D was actually a significant upgrade. Since the reliability of the TF-30 engine was a concern, the D model would use a licensed-built version of the Rolls-Royce Spade turbofan, as the United States Air Force did not use the 20mm cannon that the Navy preferred. So, these were deleted in favour of the more common M61 Vulcan 20mm Gatling cannon. The refueling probe was also deleted in favour of the United States Air Force Plug Star refueling receptacle. The first A7D flew in September 1968. So successful was the A7D in testing that the Navy would adopt a modified version as the A7E. Now many Navy pilots at the time were quite reluctant to take the first flight on yet another Navy retreaded aircraft that had been modified to some Navy standard, especially one that was considered remarkably ugly. Pilots quickly nicknamed the A7 the Slough, or Short Little Ugly Fellow. It soon gained a reputation for easy flying though, and like its Navy brother, pinpoint bombing accuracy. In wing strength in 1970, it was soon deployed to Vietnam for combat operations, mainly to replace not just the A1 but also the F-100 Super Sabre. United States Air Force pilots found that the A7 was not well suited to the tropical operations. Hot and high conditions meant that the A7D took 10 miles to generate enough power to climb above 500 feet, while a poor brake system caused it to be a real danger landing on slick runways. During Operation Linebacker, the A7s went to North Vietnam, but only sparingly and usually as Sandy Escorts, which while the Corsair II excelled at. They were far and far more effective though in South Vietnam. Alongside the Navy's A7Es, the United States Air Force's A7Ds brought the curtain down on the Vietnam War by participating in the Magoes Rescue Operation in 1975, and were among the very last United States Air Force aircraft to leave Southeast Asia. They had completed the best loss ratio of any other combat aircraft during the war, with only 6 A7Ds lost in over 12,000 missions, which is pretty damn impressive. With post-Vietnam retirement of the A1, the F-100 and the F-105, the A7D was left as one of the few US Air Force attack aircraft, but unfortunately they also planned to end procurement by 1975, and post-war budget cuts led to the addition of the Corsair II production to take up the slack. The F-111 had become a long-range strike aircraft, but for anticipated operations in Central Europe. The United States Air Force preferred the development of the A-10 Thunderbolt II over the beautiful A-7. As a result, the United States Air Force divested itself of most of its A-7s to the Air National Guard, somewhat to the aggravation of active duty units at the time. As ANG units began winning the coveted Gunsmoke bombing trophy with their A-7s, 
A minor upgrade was also mounted to the Pave Penny laser designator to the A7Ds, which began in 1979. The A7D was really well liked by its ANG pilots, whose command became the sole domain of the Corsair II by 1983. When the South Carolina ANG gave up its A7s for the F-16s in 1985, it proved a very difficult transition from the workmanlike A7 to the nimble, fast and unique F-16. Interestingly, there is one exception to this rule of one test squadron that were very proud to have the aircraft on station. These were placed at Nellis Air Force Base but operated from a small airbase at Tonopah, Nevada. No one quite knew what the squadron was doing there, though rumours came about it was not until 1989 that it was revealed that the squadron's A7s were strictly for cover and protection of the real equipment being developed around the area, the stealth F-117 Nighthawk. With the A-10 in large numbers in theatres around the world, the United States Air Force chose not to deploy the ANG A-7s to the first Gulf War, though small numbers had seen action in Grenada and the 1989 invasion of Panama. At the end of Operation Desert Storm, with the Navy retiring their last two squadrons A-7Es, the US Air Force decided to do the same, and the A-7D rapidly disappeared from active units in favour of the gorgeous F-16, with the last leaving service of the United States Air Force in 1993. A number were passed on to Greece, where it lasted until 2014. Of the 1,569 A7s produced, just under half were the United States Air Force's A7Ds or the two-seating A7Ks, and today about 18 of them survive as museum aircraft. The aircraft's capabilities for armaments and its hardpoints were quite impressive. Overall, the weapon systems placed upon it could be customised to just about any configuration of the time. Internally, it had the M61A1 Vulcan 20mm cannon with a maximum of 100 rounds, or two fuselage and six hardwing hardpoints for the carriage of just about any stores in the US infantry, including conventional low drag and retarded bombs, cluster bomb units, gun and rocket pods, defensive stores which included ANALQ 119s or 131 ECM pods, and the AIM-9LM Sidewinder missile, one on each fuselage station. It also had the ANALE 39 chaff dispenser and the typical configuration for ferrying with two or four drop tanks. Specifically for close air support or battlefield area interdiction missions, it had a combination of different capabilities. The A7D could fly to a radius of 460 miles to be on station for about one or two hours on close air support, with 1,000 rounds available for the M61A1. It also had two wing drop tanks on inboard hardpoints, stations 3 and 4, and six 12 Mark 82 500 pound bombs, a total of 12 on two double MERs or six on two TRs on mid wing hardpoints, which are stations two and five. It also had with outboard wing hardpoints, stations one and six, normally not used for dedicated anti-armor work. The loadout would be two wing drop tanks and eight Mark 20 Rock Eye CBUs on two mid wing hardpoints, which were stations two and five, and with the outboard wing hardpoints not used. The ECM pod may also be carried. The speed of this aircraft was pretty damn impressive. A maximal level clean speed at sea level was around 619 miles per hour, or 1,123 kilometers an hour. A maximum speed at 5,000 feet, or 1,525 meters, was 646 miles per hour, or 1,040 kilometers an hour, with 12 Mark 82 bombs, or 685 miles per hour, or 1,102 kilometers an hour after dropping its payload. So I think it's pretty safe to say this aircraft performed very well during its service, and although ugly compared to its counterparts such as the F-4 Phantom or some of the more fancier day jets of the time, I think it did quite well for itself. It was a chunky little beast that provided good close air support and could do what it needed to do. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. But it opened up some really cool life lessons for the United States Air Force and the US Navy to develop more interesting and formidable fighters of the time. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please leave me a like if you did enjoy it, and make sure to click the bell by the subscribe button to be notified of any upcoming content. And thank you to everyone who's been supporting my Patreon. I really do appreciate it. If you want to check out any of my social media or links towards my support, go to the description box below. All the best. Bye-bye.